Destiny Young's desire for love will make her vulnerable to a career criminal with a wicked agenda. Raised by her parents with two older brothers in the sunny San Fernando Valley, Destiny Young has always been an outgoing girl. She liked to make people laugh. She liked to be the clown. She was a teacher's pet all the time. She had a lot of friends. As a preteen, her fun and friendly nature propels her into the performing arts, and she discovers a true talent. She was a national championship cheerleader, and she wanted to be a dancer, and she could dance like no one's business. But by the time she reaches high school, everything changes for Destiny. She finds out she has a medical condition that causes weight gain. The once social little girl starts to become withdrawn and insecure. It was really hard on her body, hard on her mind. Destiny was leading a lonely life. Her self-esteem was very low, and she was depressed. The teenage year is already difficult enough as it is, but to have an issue with being overweight, it really puts them more at risk for self-loathing, for low self-esteem, even for some self-hate. After she graduates high school, Destiny takes a job at a daycare, but continues to live at home. She dates here and there, looking for that special someone, but no one ever seems to stick. When it came to young men in her life, she wasn't that sure of herself, so it took her a while to warm up to guys. Throughout her 20s, Destiny works hard, stays out of trouble, and does her best to grow as a person. Destiny's family supported her wholeheartedly, and they tried to build up her self-esteem. But it's just not enough. She was depressed because she couldn't seem to find a man. Then, at age 27, Destiny lands a new job at one of the movie studios, about 45 minutes south in downtown Los Angeles. She was employed as a security guard. She worked at Universal Studios, which is a very popular tourist attraction. So she had a good reputation. But just two years later, Destiny faces a series of devastating life events. We had had a pretty bad year. Her father had left. Her grandmother had passed away. A lot of bad things happened in our family at one time. And the only thing that was stable in her life was her job. Destiny decides to move in with her godmother in South LA to be closer to the movie studio. But her new neighborhood is a far cry from the valley. Destiny moved down to the uh, borders of the Crenshaw area, uh, which is a, a little rougher uh, part of town. And now that she's so far away from her family, she becomes even more lonely and depressed. Destiny started drinking very heavily. I guess to help ease her pain, she was sad, she was anxious. I think she was looking for love and someone to care about her. But soon, it will seem like her dreams have finally come true, until the love she finds takes her on a wild crime spree that will leave this lovelorn girl with blood on her hands. We knew that these people were dangerous. She was willing to do whatever he asked of her. He was a monster, and she just couldn't see it. Los Angeles native 29-year-old Destiny Young is lonely and hopes to one day find someone to share her life with. She was looking for love, love, tangible love, someone to see her as special and someone to focus on her. Then, two weeks after moving to the town of Crenshaw, she stops by her local liquor store and meets 26-year-old Jabbar Thomas. Jabbar was an average-looking guy. He could be like a charmer, a sweet talker, knew how to talk to the ladies and to, to get their attention. He had some swag to him. The way he carried himself was with a lot of confidence. As the two chat, Jabbar tells her he's lived in California since he was five years old and has a place with his brother down the street. He seems like a guy who has it all figured out. Jabbar was uh, the type of person who would uh, want to be the focus of attention. Uh, people see him uh, rolling down the street, wearing the right sneakers, dressed the right way. Destiny gives him her number, but she has no idea that Jabbar is actually a career criminal with a dark past. Jabbar was a drug dealer, basically. 
he was known to sell narcotics to people uh, around the area. A lot of uh, arrests for narcotics, weapons possession. In fact, Jabbar is currently on parole, released from prison only four months earlier, after serving two years for being a felon in possession of a gun. Jabbar was a very dangerous man. He was an opportunistic criminal. The street hustler spends most nights slinging drugs with his friend, 33-year-old Richard Anderson. Richard was basically a drug user, um, multiple convictions for um, possession of cocaine, and he worked for Jabbar, would kind of bring customers to Jabbar to sell drugs to. And when business is slow, the two grab some extra cash, robbing stores that are open late. And they hit the shops using Jabbar's weapon of choice. Well, the shotgun that he had, for one thing, was sawed off. So it was a little bit easier to handle, but also it preserves the shell casing inside the shotgun. It doesn't eject. He kept it with him, and he only gave it out to Richard to commit the crimes. When Jabbar calls Destiny to come hang out, she jumps at the chance. The self-conscious young woman doesn't see him as a dangerous dealer. All she sees is an attractive man paying attention to her. Having a very low self-esteem really put Destiny in a position of thinking that really no one wanted her at all. So when Jabbar came along and was filling her up with compliments, she was in hook, line, and sinker. I think Destiny let her guard down. And when he came, he was like her knight in shining armor. The career criminal never talks about his past, but it's clear that he's no angel. Destiny didn't necessarily know about his record, but I would imagine uh, having spent just a little bit of time with him, she would have found out that he was the type that was into committing crimes. But she doesn't care. She falls hard for Jabbar, and her self-esteem skyrockets whenever they're together. Beautiful. Even the hardened criminal can't help the way he feels. I think Jabbar did care for her. I don't know if he loved her, but I think he, he definitely cared for her. As the two become an item, the smooth talker realizes just how dedicated his girl is to him. He decides he could use her in his late night robberies. His idea was to start using her as a driver during these shotgun robberies. After just a couple weeks of dating, one night, he asked Destiny to take him for a ride. And so it was never really a formal agreement or, hey, let's go do these robberies. It was more of, hey, let's drive around. Jabbar tells her to head to the Pico Union area between Wilshire and downtown Los Angeles. Destiny was a good girl, but Jabbar knew how to take advantage of that, and therefore he manipulated her. And in return, she really seemed like she would do anything she could in order to keep him, no matter what was requested of her. The two drive around with Destiny behind the wheel until Jabbar notices a man walking alone in a residential area at about 3.45 a.m. Jabbar told Destiny to follow that man and then pull over uh, on the curb. He decided that's the perfect opportunity. It was a darker neighborhood, it was the middle of the night, and the male was by himself. She does what he says and pulls over. Her man jumps out. Jabbar approached him. He didn't have a mask. He just carried his shotgun with him. He points the gun at him and demands his wallet, but the man refuses to give it up. Where the money at? I need this money for my kid. He took his wallet and threw it over a fence, which prevented Jabbar from getting his wallet. Jabbar is furious. Back at the car, Destiny anxiously tries to watch her boyfriend in the rearview mirror, but can't quite see what's happening in the darkness. She was also sort of acting as a lookout, so she was paying attention to the front and the sides as well. Suddenly, there's a loud bang. Destiny heard a shotgun blast. After falling for career criminal Jabbar Thomas, Destiny Young is acting as the lookout and getaway driver, while her new boyfriend robs a man at gunpoint in the Pico Union area of downtown Los Angeles. Then a shot rings out. Destiny looked back and saw Jabbar coming back to the car, skipping as if he was happy. Jabbar got back into the car. They drove off. Destiny asked him, did you shoot him? 
He assured Destiny, I just shot off the weapon to scare him. Oh, no one got hurt. It was just a scare shot. But he's lying. Jabbar has just shot 35-year-old Marcelo Aragon in his chest, killing him in cold blood. Marcelo Aragon was the father of two, and he was working to support his wife and two children that were in Mexico, and hopefully eventually bring them up here to the United States. But Destiny takes her boyfriend at his word and continues to drive, unaware she's now an accessory to murder. In my heart of hearts, I know that Destiny would not have gone along with that if she had known that he was going to kill somebody. She respects life too much. Destiny really wanted to believe Jabbar. Therefore, whatever he said, she bought it. And there was also this element of excitement, so it almost became an addictive sort of a behavior to be with him. For the next two weeks, fueled by love and the thrill, Destiny continues to be the getaway driver. She helps her man, and sometimes his friend, Richard Anderson, commit multiple robberies in the southwest area of LA. They were robbing people on the street. They were also robbing uh, liquor stores, donut shops, those types of businesses. I think that she was doing it out of the need for love and affection, and, and so she would take that risk. Give me everything you got. Just to hang on to what she had. And as the Los Angeles Police Department gathers evidence on the string of robberies, it becomes clear they're connected. The range of uh, crimes occurred within a five-mile radius, approximately. And we knew a shotgun was involved. Three weeks into their crime spree, the couple drives through the more affluent area of Wilshire. About 1 AM in the morning, Destiny and Jabbar were driving around looking for another robbery victim. Destiny and Jabbar saw a man walking from his car towards an apartment carrying a couple of bags of groceries. Again, Jabbar tells Destiny to pull over, and she does. Well, she wanted to be a good girlfriend or showed loyalty to him. She was willing to do uh, whatever he, he asked, basically. When Destiny parked the car, the man was behind her, so she was acting again as a lookout. Jabbar jumps out and points his sawed-off shotgun at his latest victim and he told the man to get down on the ground and to lie face down on the ground. The man complied with what Jabbar wanted. He gave him his keys, his wallet, and even his groceries. He gave up everything he had. But despite his cooperation, the ruthless robber is not yet done with him. He then placed the shotgun in the back of the man's head and he executed him. There's not really a good reason as to why Jabbar shot him. He had given up his property. He was compliant. The only explanation can be is that Jabbar just liked to kill. Destiny hears the shot, but once again, she couldn't see what went down. And uh, Jabbar came back into the car, and she asked him if he shot anybody. Did anybody get hurt? Nope. And again, Jabbar told her they just shot off the gun to scare him. And I think this really speaks to how much she really wanted to believe him and showed off her naivete as far as believing anything, just wanting to be there for him. Even though neighbors heard the shots, no one calls police until the next day when a neighbor walking his dog finds the man's lifeless body. Police arrive on the scene, and after speaking with neighbors, they identify the victim as Gabriel ben -Mir. Gabriel was involved in Hollywood. He was a music coordinator for a major cable uh, network. And that immediately brought media attention to this case. Now, with a second late night shotgun murder, the investigation has officially become a high profile case. And it's not long before police catch a break. After Gabriel's murder, Richard, Destiny, and Jabbar uh, went on a spree and committed four robberies in one night, um, a liquor store, a donut shop, and two pedestrians. It turns out the liquor store has excellent surveillance cameras, and detectives get a clear image of the perp's vehicle. The getaway vehicle was a Crown Victoria with an unusual dent in the front hood. The image is immediately circulated throughout the LAPD. We knew that these people were dangerous, and it was just a matter of time before they struck again.
After Desi Young and her boyfriend Jabbar Thomas commit a string of late night robberies and two murders in the LA area, police are closing in on them when surveillance video reveals the getaway car. Within hours, they had a, a flyer posted and had officers on the lookout. Then one day, the couple are out cruising around near 10th Avenue and Washington Boulevard when an officer spots them. He pulls them over, but not before calling for backup. Destiny pulled over into a parking lot. Uh, multiple units arrived, a, a lot of other police officers, the helicopters overhead. Knowing the killer could be in the car, police surround the vehicle, ready for anything. They swarmed the car. The whole area was terrified and they submitted to arrest without any resistance. The two are taken to the police station for questioning, while police search the vehicle. Inside of the trunk of the vehicle in particular was property from some of the robberies and also the shotgun used in the two murders. But despite the evidence against him, Jabbar refuses to talk. Jabbar did not admit to anything. He did not admit to any wrongdoing. He did not admit to taking part in any of the robberies or the homicides. Destiny, however, admits to being part of the robberies, but she's stunned to learn that two people were killed in the crime spree. Her reaction to being informed about the deaths appeared to be very genuine and grief-stricken. I didn't know. She was very uh, devastated, very emotional. And I think for her at that point, she realized she has something very serious to deal with. She tells police she heard the gunshots, but her man had a ready explanation. Please, I know I'm gonna get hurt. Destiny wanted to live in her own reality because she didn't want to give up Jabbar, so she continued in this sort of la-la land that she was in. She was willing to risk everything for him. I know she was very hurt by what had happened, hurt by the fact, first, that two men had lost their lives, and then hurt by the fact that she was with the person that did it. I didn't know. But despite her claims, there's enough evidence to charge both Jabbar and Destiny with multiple robberies and the two murders. Jabbar is charged with eight counts of robbery and attempted robbery, one count of being a felon in possession of a handgun, and two counts of capital murder. Destiny is charged with six counts of robbery and attempted robbery, and two counts of murder. While awaiting trial, she writes affectionate letters to Jabbar in jail. It was obvious that Destiny's feelings for Jabbar continued. She was concerned for his emotional and physical welfare. Then just before her trial, Destiny realizes she could receive the death penalty and decides to make a deal. Destiny agreed to cooperate with prosecution and testify against Jabbar. She also agreed to plead to lesser charges because she wanted the truth to be known. Destiny pled guilty to two counts of manslaughter, six counts of robbery and attempted robbery. She received a sentence of 25 years in prison. It was a high price for Destiny to pay for about three weeks of romance. At Jabbar's trial, he manages to avoid the death penalty. Jabbar was convicted of seven counts of robbery and attempted robbery, felon in possession of a firearm, and two counts of capital murder. He received two consecutive terms of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Destiny still maintains she had no idea anyone was killed. I do believe that Destiny had genuine remorse for the individuals, and that's part of the reason why she decided to cooperate. Destiny had really low self-esteem, so she really was prime and at risk for someone like Jabbar. And at the end of the day, he showed her a love that she never thought that she could get on her own. She now has to live with the fact that after 30 years of being a good citizen, only 30 days with Jabbar cost her 25 years of her life. Destiny was no hardened criminal. She just got lost somehow along the way. And now she's trying to find her way back. She's been taking life skill classes and learning about how to cope with things. She's trying to rebuild her life and hope that someday she'll have a life.
In North Carolina, Dominique Atkinson has found the man of her dreams in a handsome Marine. Dominique never fell for a guy like she fell from Marquez. But when someone stands in the way of their love, they decide to eliminate the obstacle permanently. They wanted to be free, and they were willing to kill for it. It was crazy and shocking. He would tell her what to do, and she did it. And later, in California, Destiny Young has always battled with low self-esteem. Destiny was a little overweight, and I think she was afraid of being rejected. Which makes her the perfect target for a manipulative career criminal with a sadistic scheme. This set off a violent crime spree. The whole area was terrified. Who would be next? Her love for him blinded her to his evil. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Hailing from Wilmington, North Carolina, Dominique Atkinson is a happy, outgoing child surrounded by affection. Her mom and dad, they was not together or anything, but they managed to live under the same roof with their daughter, and they made it work for her. Dominique was uh, very lucky. Uh, she was raised in a home with a mother and father. She was very well-loved, well-cared for. And the young girl wants for nothing. They spoiled her rotten. She got everything and anything that she asked for. Nice clothes, nice shoes. There's always something new because her mom made sure she had whatever she wanted. Parents really mean well when they try to give their children material things but the kids come to expect those material goods from everyone else. If not, then they're really not happy at all. By the time Dominique reaches her teens, her bubbly personality attracts lots of friends, especially of the opposite sex. Dominique had a lot of friends, a lot of friends. She's a really, uh, real, like, loving person. And then her whole life changes when at just 16 years old, she becomes a mother. She drops out of high school to care for her newborn baby full time. But the spoiling continues. She wasn't working. She wasn't doing anything. Dominique mom was taking care of her. Dominique dad was taking care of her. But the outgoing teen mom can't stay away from the boys. I couldn't say that Dominique was real smart on uh, choices that she made in life. Over the next four years, Dominique continues to live at home. And after a few failed relationships, she's left with two more children. And now, 20 years old, she finds herself pregnant yet again with her fourth child. But despite being pregnant and a busy single mom, Dominique's still young and vibrant, looking for that special someone. And she has a certain type in mind. Dominique was attracted to military men. Dominique grew up in an environment in North Carolina where she was surrounded by military bases. So I think that influenced a lot of uh, Dominique's uh, desire for having a relationship with a man in the military. But it's more than their uniform that attracts her. She wants security. She knew that the wife got military benefits and they had a very stable financial income. And so she was looking for that. I guess her mentality was since my parents spoil me, then if I be with a man, then he has to do what my parents did for me. And it's not long before her prayers are answered. Now five months pregnant after another failed relationship, while Dominique is hanging out at her girlfriend's house, she meets someone who fits the bill. 23-year-old Lance Corporal Marquise Cheatham. He was a Marine. He was handsome, he was strong, he had an athletic body, and she was immediately attracted to him. He had a nice sense of humor. He was built. Yeah, but he was, how can I say it, arrogant? He made sure you know how tough he was. Originally from Montgomery, Alabama, he's been in the military for four years. <laughs> I love it. I plan on being there for a long time, so. His recent post, a station at Camp Lejeune, just an hour away in Jacksonville, North Carolina. In the four years that he's been in the Marine Corps, he's even attained some service medals. So he's very proud of who he is and what he's become. The fact that he's in the service is music to her ears. 
She was excited by that because she loved military guys. And he liked her too. So they connected to each other right away. The two start hanging out regularly, although she's hesitant to tell him about her delicate condition. He didn't know um, that she was pregnant when they first met. She had a little pudge, but like she wasn't blown up all the way. But the chemistry between them is so powerful that within just a few weeks, they are attached at the hip. Dominique never fell for a guy like she fell from Marquez. It was different with him. They fell in love quick. I have to tell you something. Even when Dominique finally admits she's the mother of three, with another on the way, the tough Marine says he doesn't mind. I love kids. In her eyes, he seems like the perfect man. There's only one problem. Marquise was married. He was married to a woman who lived in Montgomery, Alabama, his hometown. He tells Dominique that his wife, 20-year-old Ashley McCarthy, was his high school sweetheart, and they eloped less than two years before. While uh, Marquise was in North Carolina, uh, Ashley lived with her father in Montgomery, Alabama. But he assures her that it's already over between them. He said that um, they were getting a divorce. Like, pretty much everything was already getting finalized. I got the divorce papers signed. He wanted to be with Dominique. He said that Ashley didn't matter. He didn't love her. And his new girlfriend believes him. From Dominique's eyes, they was divorced. He done said divorced, so hey, she was all game. Dominique was young and naive, and she really thought this guy was going to leave his wife. So she stuck on in there, hoping that's what would happen. Despite Marquise's marriage, the two young lovers continue to see one another. And when Dominique gives birth to a baby girl three months later, I love it. Her boyfriend becomes the provider she's always hoped for. He gave her the world. He got an apartment. When she had her baby, he was taking care of the baby and everything. He spoiled Dominique, just like Dominique's family spoiled her. He lavished her with gifts. He took care of the kids. But back in Montgomery, Alabama, the Marine's real wife has no idea about a divorce or what her husband is up to. Ashley was not aware of Dominique and the fact that Marquise was actually seeing someone behind her back. The one thing she does know, however, is her AWOL Marine isn't sending her any funds to live off of. She's struggling, so she's calling him. She can't get him on the phone, and when she does get him on the phone, he's evasive. And Marquise ignores her. He really turns her off. He gives her the dead treatment, the silent treatment, and this infuriates her. So one day that spring, Ashley starts calling his commanders, knowing the military's strict honor code, and tells them that her husband isn't taking care of her. The commanders, of course, discipline Marquise and told Marquise that he had to get it together. He had to make things right with his wife. And the Marine is not happy about it. He was livid. Like, he couldn't believe she had done that. Because now she's messing with his money. She's messing with his career. It's the last straw. Any love he had for his former high school sweetheart is officially gone. Everything changed. Marquise made the decision that he didn't want Ashley just gone from his life. He didn't want a divorce or a separation. He wanted her dead. And when he tells Dominique that his wife is going after his money, she agrees. They have to get her out of their lives. Dominique loves him so much. She's going to do whatever it takes to hold on to him. He had a hold on her life like she listened to him. If Marquise asks Dominique to do something, it's gonna get done. Wilmington, North Carolina, Dominique Atkinson agrees to help her boyfriend of nine months, Marquise Cheatham, get his wife, Ashley McCarthy, out of their lives so they can be free. She knew that Ashley was making trouble for them in Alabama. It was going to end in the loss of his career, the loss of income for them both. Okay. Dominique was so in love with Marquise that she didn't really see what she was getting herself into 
All she knew was that Ashley was in the way. It's not clear if she knew how far he was willing to go in order to get rid of his wife. A few days later, Dominique and Marquise make the nine-hour drive to Montgomery, Alabama. Dominique had told us she was going to Alabama because Marquise had something to do with his divorce. Once they arrive, Dominique and Marquise stay with his mother in North Montgomery. Then around 8 p.m., he calls Ashley. I want to meet up with you. He lies to her and says he's jumping on a flight to Alabama so the two can discuss their relationship in person. Ashley agrees to pick him up at the airport at 11 p.m. That night, the plan is set into motion. Dominique drops Marquise off at a store across from the airport where Ashley would meet him. Once his estranged wife arrives, it's not long before things get heated between them. The reunion is nothing like Ashley probably imagined it to be. They start arguing. The argument spills over into the parking lot. Still fighting, they get into Ashley's car. The argument becomes intense. It becomes so volatile that Marquise decides that this is the moment to pull out a gun, and he does. He pulls out a gun on Ashley. And Marquise uses his military-issued gun to hold her hostage in her own car. And at this point, she has to be terrified. He demands that she start driving. So they drive back to Marquise's mother's home, where Dominique is waiting. When they arrive, Dominique is taken aback by how quickly things have escalated. Marquise shouts commands. Dominique does as she's told. She helps her man force his wife into the trunk of the car. It was like he had Dominique under control. Like, she do what he tell her to do. Dominique didn't really know Ashley at all. It's quite possible that the only way she perceived her was someone who was in the way of their happiness. And she would have done anything at this point just to please him, just to make him happy. With his wife in the trunk, Marquise hops in the driver's seat of Ashley's car. He tells Dominique to follow him in his car, and his girlfriend obeys. They stop near the woods about one mile west of Marquise's mother's house. But right away, the plan goes awry. Ashley, knowing that her life is in danger, pulls the safety latch in the trunk of the car. She bolts from the car, she proceeds to run away from the car. Marquise sees his wife flee. He takes out his gun and runs after Ashley. Marquise is pursuing her on foot. He's chasing her down, and he's firing shots. Dominique can't see anything, but she hears several gunshots and freezes. I'm thinking in her head, it's like, for one, she's scared. She don't know what to do. Once Dominique heard those gunshots, this situation was real, and she was in deep. And Ashley, at this point, really needed her help. But the reality is, she didn't lift a finger to help her. Marquise continues to fire at Ashley, and finally gets a lock on his target. He hits her twice in the back. She collapses. Even though she collapsed, she can gets up and continues to run. Her life is at stake. She makes one last dash for help. She sees a house. She gets to the house, and she collapses on the stairs. She's literally a step away from help. But Marquise has finally caught up. As he catches his breath, he coldly raises the gun. She begged for her life. She said, please, you don't have to do this. And later, in Southern California, Destiny Young will join her boyfriend in a deadly crime spree, all in the name of love. The whole area was terrified. Destiny had that devotion to him and loved him through it all. <laughs> In Montgomery, Alabama, Dominique Atkinson's married boyfriend, Marquise Cheatham, has his wife, Ashley McCarthy, cornered after shooting her twice in the back. Please, you don't have to do this. And in an act so hateful, he fires. The single shot kills Ashley instantly. 
he knew Ashley since they were children. They were high school sweethearts. I mean, how he can see her begging for her life and be able to pull that trigger, I don't think can be explained. Marquise leaves her body there and runs back to where Dominique is waiting. Stunned. Dominique knows he just killed his wife and she's stunned. What happened? She had plenty of opportunity to alert the police. She had plenty of time to save Ashley's life, but she didn't. It's quite possible that Dominique didn't fully comprehend what was going on, that in fact she had helped someone take someone else's life. Because if she had known what was going on, she wouldn't be able to face the truth of what had happened. She probably didn't know what to do. There was She was probably overwhelmed with so many things going through her mind. Marquise has Dominique help him dump Ashley's car behind an abandoned building a few blocks away before they take off in his car. They head back to the house so that they can change clothes at his mother's house. They get cleaned up, they jump back in the vehicle, and they head back to uh, North Carolina. He also gets rid of the weapon, uh, Ashley's purse, her cell phone. They drive back to Wilmington and return to their lives as usual. Later that morning, a woman walking her children to school discovers Ashley's dead body. She immediately calls the police. The death of Ashley was devastating for her family. Ashley was well-loved. She volunteered for everything. I mean, it was very traumatic. Heartbroken, her father tells police that the last time he spoke to her was just before she went to pick up her husband, Marquise, at the airport. Ashley's father tells police they were going to talk and work things out. So right away, police have a lead that they can go on. As the couple is resuming their daily lives, police connect the dots when cell phone records show that both Marquise and Dominique were in the area at the time Ashley was killed. Two days later, they arrest the couple for murder. The first time I heard about the incident, I got a phone call from somebody. I was like, just drop the phone. I couldn't believe it. I still don't even believe it. She is not capable of killing somebody. Marquise is extradited to Alabama to face a capital murder charge. When questioned, he first denies that he was anywhere near Montgomery. I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't until the police brought in his phone records that he finally admitted to the fact that he was in Alabama, that he had met with his wife. They got into a furious argument. Marquise ends up confessing. He tells them that they had an argument and that Ashley became angry and, and hit him. He told them that he pulled the weapon and shot at her. After that, he claims he doesn't remember anything. Everything was a blur. Four days after he killed his wife, Marquise Cheatham is officially charged with capital murder during a robbery. He's immediately discharged from the Marines. Dominique also admits she was there and heard the gunshots, but says that she had no idea he was going to kill Ashley. Dominique didn't give any clue as to what happened, how it was planned, how she was involved. No, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I don't know if she did that because she wanted to continue being loyal to him. I talked to her on a regular whenever she got incarcerated, and she was still worried about Marquise. It was crazy. She's sitting here telling me she still loves him. I'm like, why do you still love him? How can you still love him? Knowing he might get the death penalty, Marquise Cheatham pleads guilty to murder. Just a few months later, Dominique Atkinson follows suit. They both receive life sentences. She lost a lot. She lost her family. She lost her kids. She lost a lot of things in her life. Everything is completely gone, like vanished away. Blinded by love, Dominique now wishes she could have helped Ashley that night. She was very remorseful. Dominique would have never found herself in this situation if it wasn't for my kids. Never. Dominique sacrificed her entire life, and she missed out on seeing her children grow up, all because of her intense love for Marquise. She wanted Marquise, 
and even if it meant someone else paying the price for the two of them to be together, then she was going to do it. Dominique Atkinson made a deadly decision to have her lover all to herself. 